Welcome back to another episode. I am here today with really a soul sister and someone who I have created this beautiful sisterhood with over the last multiple years. And we have shown up in each other's lives so divinely in such divine timing for the right reasons and held space for one another. So I'm here to share with you, my dear friend and sister, Catherine Ducey. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> so excited to dive in. We were just talking offline about how we feel like we're here to flow today and serve the best way we can. But a piece of that has always been just us uniquely holding space for one another and allowing things to flow. And so welcome to a catch-up conversation with Catherine and Jackie, and we're going to see where this, you know, where these mics take us and where this conversation goes and mm. how we can serve everyone listening in best. Mm. I love that. Happy to flow. Mm. Mm. Miss Catherine Ducey, this is always a loaded question to start with. And I know we can go back in so many different areas of your life but I'd love you to just share your story and share some of these pivotal moments that led you from your childhood to today. And then let's, let's explore some of those things together. Sure. Well, um, I think one of the most pivotal moments in my life that changed everything was when I was in my 30, I was about 33 and I started to notice a lot more hair in the drain when I was showering. And over time, noticed that, oh my God, I'm losing a lot of hair. And I'm really curious about what that is, what that means. Um, I've always had an attachment to my hair and it has been a way to protect me and to, I don't know, at some points in my life, give me worth, give me value, all that kind of stuff. So that feeling of, oh my God, am I losing my hair? And then also this attachment to it being, you know, this way of, of covering up uh, mm -hmm. stuff that I didn't even know I was covering up. Um, that combination was quite frightening for me. And I chose to go and talk to a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and it was honestly, Jackie, one of the most fascinating first sessions, probably more so for me and not for the therapist <laughs> because they see this all the time, but I marched right into that appointment and, and I kind of dominated. I think that was also a part of the way that I used to handle myself when I was afraid mm -hmm. um, and I knew I was going to be emotional and I dominated the whole conversation. I'll never forget it. And I, I basically just told her like, Here's my history. Here's my childhood, which I'll get into in a second. And at the end of the session, um, I paused <laughs> and gave her a moment. For the talk. first time. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we the same human? <laughs> yeah. And then, I, yeah, it was like nearing the end. Like, it was like I was the therapist. And I was like, and, and so it was near the end. And um, I paused. And I was like, do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, hmm. My goodness, um, Catherine, you experienced a lot of trauma growing up. And I'll never forget when she said that. And everything in my body kind of like relaxed. It could have gone either way. It could have been like, holy shit, go on the defense, but everything relaxed. And I actually felt seen and I burst into tears. And I said, I wondered. I wondered, and thank you for, you know, acknowledging that. I'm sure I didn't say it in such a beautiful and eloquent way, because at that time I was also pretty like dominatrix, <laughs> but I, I probably just said, cool. And she mm -hmm. said, great. I'd love for you to come back next week. And I said, yeah, no problem. And so began this unraveling of a childhood that the way I saw it was pretty awesome and all was well. And I had two parents and they, we had money and we had a home and we had 
food and I got to go to summer camp and I had new clothes when I needed it. I had all those things. We got to go on family vacations a lot. Like when everyone else was stuck in Toronto, we were going to Florida three times a year mm-hmm. and all of that, like it all looked great, but I came out of it pretty damaged and could not figure out why. So that began my journey. I'm 40, I'll be 42 this year. And I, for years now, have been unpacking what happened to me. And it's this kind of the same old story that most people, you know, will will discover as they sort of start to pick away at the at the layers and go a little bit deeper. My parents grew up in homes where they their emotional needs were never taken care of. Mm. So feeling was not something that was accepted. It wasn't something that was, you know, you weren't allowed to feel like it just wasn't a thing. And they both also had like a lot of trauma in their childhoods, like death of people around them. That was really pivot at pivotal times that was never processed. And um, when they had children, they only knew, you know, what to do. And they, you know, they followed the same path that their parents did. And, you know, you give your kids things like physical need, like you have their, take care of their physical needs. You make sure that there's food on the table. You make sure that, you know, they've got clothing and you make sure that, you know, they've got places to go and sports and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to their emotional body or like their spiritual body, even, I don't know what to do with that. So I, was born a very sensitive baby. I was incredibly sensitive. And my folks actually didn't know what to do with that. And over time, I learned that being sensitive didn't get me a lot of attention. In fact, it got me a lot of negative attention. And so I buried that part of me. It was also deeply connected to my intuition and my inner wisdom. And uh, over time, especially through my teens, is where things started to really go kind of sideways for me. Um, And of course, I didn't even know this until I was in therapy and started to talk about things and realized that um, I become completely dissociated from my body. I had no connection to my body. Um, which later led to me saying yes to things around sex and sexuality that were a a hard no for me, Um, Mm -hmm. not being safe for myself. I didn't even realize that. Um, And yeah, it it was really like my teens were things, I was getting a lot of feedback on um, I was getting a lot of feedback and confusing messages about like who to be also because you're in school and you're surrounded by a lot of other children and uh, you're picking up all of this like messaging and you're finding your way and you're finding your voice and all this kind of stuff. And when you are someone who as a child becomes disconnected from the essence of you, which is my sensitivity, well, you don't know what else to do. And you, of course, look outside of yourself for who you are. You find yourself somewhere in other people and you let them tell you who to be. And, you know, so I started to like say yes to things like drinking when I didn't even want to or going out and being social when I wasn't even that interested. Like I, I, I consider myself actually a late bloomer um, who was posing as like the cool girl and really dancing between this line of like, I want to say yes to these things, but like, is it just me? Cause like, I want to go home and play with my Barbies. Like I, I had, I was a more of a late bloomer. I had dolls until like a later age than a lot of kids. I believed in Santa Claus until like grade eight, you know, you're 13. Like there was a yeah. lot of interesting things there. So hence, and hence the sensitivity mm-hmm. side of me. So the long and the short is um, I, I learned over time, over the years that I had shamed and and criticized this sensitive side of me because my parents didn't recognize it in me because they didn't even know how to, because they couldn't recognize it in themselves. And that 
returning back home to that part of me and welcoming that part of me back in that I decided I hated. I hated her. I hated that girl who would cry at, you know, at some things that people wouldn't cry at or um, felt hurt if someone else, you know, felt hurt and not in a codependent way, but more in like a really deeply like empathetic way. Mm -hmm. And so my journey has been welcoming back this sensitive side of me, um, who is such a beautiful part of me now. I spend hours a day with her. She she needs a lot of quiet time. Um, I have a morning practice that I haven't missed in a long time, not for anything. I don't care if I'm jumping on a flight at 8 a.m. and have to be out of the house by five. I will be at the altar at 4 a.m. because I am not safe for other people if I am not taking care of some of my own needs um, around these sensitive sensitivities of mine. So that's that's been like the, the biggest like lesson for me over the course of the last few years and what happened to me when I was younger. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for being just open and really transparent about it and about some of the really hard moments. We met after I posted a video on LinkedIn about my journey and my story and you reached out to me. And I get five years ago, six years ago, I'm not exactly sure the day I should look back to it, but there was, there's so many moments you share where I'm like nodding my head for those that can't see me because I had a similar lived experience or I find myself in Catherine's story. And if you're listening and you're thinking that as well, you know, there you're listening for a reason is what I will say is like, you have tuned into this episode in particular because you're meant to be here and you're meant to hear this particular story. You know, one of the, um, ways that Catherine has supported me in the last multiple years is she does early childhood coaching. She does coaching with others around their own experiences and has made that transition from not just you know, the therapist's office to spending the last decade kind of going inward, but then after finding out kind of and reflecting about what was going on within herself, then thinking about how can I support other people or, Hey, more people actually need to know about this because we're all probably dealing with something that happened in inner childhood. I'm curious for you through those last, let's call it a decade from the therapist to what you do today can you talk through some of those transitions you made of like, Hey, after I learned something, it just feels natural in terms of the evolution of life to give back and to teach. Cause I know you were such a beautiful teacher and have been for me. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, it's interesting because you've caught me at a really, really interesting juncture in my teaching. <laughs> Mm. And I haven't spoken to actually anybody about this. So this is wow. the first time this is going to be expressed. Um, and I'm trusting that this is where it's meant to all unfold. Mm. But so I, I've actually, in my lifetime, um, part of why my soul is here, um, if you believe that your soul chooses your parents and it's here to you know, transcend and, and complete something from the past, whatever that looks like. Part of why my soul is here is to manifest freedom through transcending victimization. Ooh. Yeah. So it, it's funny, as you say, like you became like an inner child, you know, you, you understand inner child or childhood development and inner child mm -hmm. healing. While yes, all of this is true, um, one of the transformations I'm currently going through is that in the early stages of my career, probably for a good half of it in as a coach, I was in fact coming from a very victim-y place. <laughs> and so the pendulum swung from a very disempowered place over here of like, I'm invisible, I'm not important, I didn't matter to my parents, no one got me, this really like sucked to fuck you, <laughs> I'm gonna prove that 
you guys were at fault. Now I have all this information to use against you. And like, but in like a kind of a subtle way. Mm, there was an undertone who, though. There was an undertone. And those mm -hmm. who can sniff that out saw it. Mm. So you've caught me in the last, like, so in the last three years, I've swung the pendulum. So I went from one victim conscious in the area of consciousness to like the other end. And now I've swung the pendulum into the middle. And I'm balancing all of this out. And I'm, I'm looking at like, how can this work be of service to others without keeping them stuck in this place of shit, my parents really screwed me up. And now I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> and I don't know how to, how to get out of this and how to create the life that I meant to and, and step up into my like truest potential. So my practice has evolved a lot over the years, but it initially was more of a soapbox, which I'm realizing now. And, you know, mm -hmm. we as adults who do this work, we can look back with compassion without regret and say, wow, <laughs> I did not know that at that time. And I see that now and learn the lessons I was meant to learn from that and, you know, take that and implement the lessons in the now. Mm -hmm. So I've also also processed a lot of this now, but when I first realized it, a lot of shame and a lot of guilt came up. Um, and I think this is an important message for people who do this work is this work is incredibly important and very valuable and will unlock some of your deepest, if not all potential in life and why you're here and make things a heck of a lot easier. Uh, and it can also keep you in a holding pattern depending on who you work with mm -hmm. and what level of expertise they're at and what kind of tools they have and all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm now in this place of, I don't want this industry to become something that keeps people in this perpetual state of the world is happening to me. I really want this to become about the world is happening for me. Mm -hmm. And my ultimate gift and why I believe I'm here is, like I said, to transcend victimization into freedom. Mm -hmm. And that is through recognizing my own shadow that has been living <laughs> in the darkness, had no idea um, to unlock and manifest that freedom of uh, that gift of freedom and help other people do that now. Yeah. Wow. Full body goosebumps when you said it the first time. Thank you for sharing it here for the first time and for just opening your heart to your real lessons learned and like lived experience and how something I talk about so many times is you don't know what you don't know until you know. <laughs> and the minute you know, then you can look back and, and create reflections and have compassion for other versions of yourself. And those messages come in so many divine ways. It's through a friend who maybe holds up the mirror. It's through your own lived experience of like, oh, I see it now differently because I've maybe had a lived experience between that moment and this moment. And now I can see things differently. There's so many unlocks that happen to get us there or ways that these messages come through for us. Yeah. My curiosity to like pull this string a little bit more is. What does that look like? What does it look like to truly go from a victim mentality, which I have lived in, mm -hmm. and there's likely still shadow pieces of me that does, mm -hmm. to this life is happening for me mm -hmm. and to transcend that victim mentality? What does that look like from your paradigm? Um, well, I guess using real life examples is what helps people to really understand stuff. So for those of you who don't know, I was married up until August of this, of 2022. I was married for one year. I was with my husband for a total of two and a half years, three years, maybe. And during that time, there were parts of my life 
including my relationship to my parents, including my relationship to one of my brothers and my relationship to my husband and my relationship to my stepdaughter, actually, that felt really hard, like really fucking hard, like unnecessarily difficult. And it's interesting because I had all, I have hired some of the best coaches hands down in the industry. I have spent all my money. (laughs) I know I've witnessed the last five years of like, oh, you're working with that person. Like the best of the best in the industry. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and yet not a lot was changing if I'm honest. And that has nothing to do with those coaches and everything to do with the client with me. And over time, I kept being, I kept having these like same fights and, and I don't want to say fights, but collisions and discomfort and frustration with my folks and with my husband and with, you know, whomever. And I started to notice that my language was things like, well, if they wouldn't do that, I wouldn't do this. Say that one again, right? If they would Uh change, I would show up differently. My behavior is dependent on dot, dot, dot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And when you live with a spouse and every day you hear yourself saying that like a broken freaking record, at some point being a highly intelligent person, you've got to ask yourself, okay, <laughs> like what is it that, is it that I keep thinking that you need to change in order for me to feel more comfortable with myself? Like, is it that? Oh, it's that, you know, that I love the, the Instagram reel that goes around or the voice, the, that people use in their stories where it's like, am I the drama? I'm not the drama. I, oh, I'm the drama. (laughs) Oh, I'm the drama. turns out I am the drama. (laughs) I'm the drama. And by the way, that dramatic part of me, if you understand parts work and internal family systems, which I do very well and I use in a lot of my work, that drama part of me is a beautiful part of me. There are no bad parts, as we say. And she shows up to protect me. So does the victim-y part of me. And so I had ignored these parts of me for a long time. We never had a conversation. And so you asked me, like, how do you start to like do this? Well, you start to look at where do you continue to create the same results over and over and over again, where you want to create something different. Okay. That's the first thing. And then you kind of go, you look inward and you go, what is it that I might not be seeing? And then what you do is you, you, use shadow work. So I also use shadow work and all my work. So anything that drove me banana pants about my husband like just banana pants, rather than saying, ew, or judging him, I would take that, you know, they always say point one finger outward, you point three back at yourself. So I pointed three back at myself and I thought, where am I not accepting who I am or still judging myself, right? Based on the behavior that I'm seeing that he's exhibiting right now, like you just have to take a look at people's behaviors. And if it if it drives you fucking crazy, pardon my French. <laughs> this that's welcome here. We're Canadian. This is where you want to take a look. Yes. Okay, because this is an area of you that you have disowned because it didn't get recognized when you were a kid, or you got in trouble for it, or you know, whatever that is. And When you disown parts of yourself, you feel inadequate. So one of my other biggest shadow woundings has been inadequacy. I have had a deep sense of inadequacy. Couple that with victimization and holy shit, you've got yourself a beautiful cocktail. (laughs) And not the one that numbs you out. No. And it's, yeah. a, it's almost like, it's wild that I've even been able to show up in my life with these two mm. things 
So that that's that's been actually when you said, hmm, I just went, yeah, like I have a lot of compassion for myself because I've always been fighting, forcing. I have a tendency to force because I have a deep feeling like most humans of inadequacy and victimization. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much here. I'm like, there's so much to unpack. And I so grateful that you're able to do it through your own story and that you're willing and able to share first, because that if you're listening, like I am, I'm like following Catherine's story and being present as well as like my own story starts to show up as well. You know, two words really came up for me through the last kind of uh, multiple conversations, but these last couple minutes that we've been talking and they're questions that I've always had and questions that continue to come up for me. I know for myself, a lot of the times when I feel fear, some sort of fear or a disconnectedness to someone, something, somewhere, or myself, I leave my body. I disassociate. I literally come out of my body. I am now at a point where I'm so sensitive. I feel it happen. I wasn't there always. Um, in fact, a lot of the work you and I did together really kind of cultivated that sensitivity to be aware of it. If somebody's listening and they, they're getting a ping right now that they feel like they disassociate a lot and they come out of their bodies and insert any one of the multiple things that they could do numb out, you know, look outside of themselves for worth, et cetera. How does somebody one recognize that? And then two, like, what do you do with that? How do you actually cultivate a practice to start to re-embody who you really are meant to be in this world? God. Know, that's a loaded one, but it keeps coming up for me. Disassociation and fear are like two things. I think the collective as humanity has, and then yeah. I, then I layer on women and I'm like, gosh, it's literally, these are the conversations I'm having every day. There's an undertone of fear. There's an undertone of dis- yeah. like leaving our bodies to feel connected to something else. So we don't have to get connected to ourselves. Yeah. Well, the answer is actually in your question. Mm. Always is. I know. So, <laughs> Tell me, answer, show me. In your question. It's recognizing that we as human beings have a tendency to fear our fear. We have a tendency to fear our fear. The reason you will leave is because fear shows up on the scene, that part of you that is afraid and suddenly you want to compensate for it. You don't think it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. You want to run away. You want to hide. You want to leave. So I too, I like bless my mother, but she was afraid of her own shadow. We feared every, everything was to be feared. You got a cut. Ah! Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of worrying as well. Like I, Grew up with a lot of like worry. Worry. Mm -hmm. Worry is another one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a big part of this work is knowing that what we, what most of us are avoiding is a feeling. At the end Mm -hmm. of the day, that is it. I don't want to look at my taxes because I'm afraid that I owe more than I thought I was going to owe. And then I'm going to get in trouble and blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to, I'm avoiding the fear that I'm anticipating is going to come up, let's say. So if we can start to understand that there isn't a single emotion that the body cannot experience, there is not a single emotion. And some people will be listening to this and they'll be like, yeah, but I get it. I do. This is not something that happens overnight. This takes time. You want to work with someone who understands the mind-body connection that understands the nervous system, that understands, um, that isn't like gonna uh, what sort of bypass your feelings, you know, that's important. Mm -hmm. So fearing your fear is the first problem that you have. I wouldn't even say it's a problem. It's actually a great insight. Oh, Mm -hmm. shit, I do fear my fear, okay? 
So once you know, okay, fear is not a bad thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It can be a beautiful gift. It's an opportunity, in fact, to look a little deeper. I get excited when fear shows up. I kind of go, ooh, yep, there's definitely something here for me. And I have two choices. Either I run away from this or I lean in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here lies the victim mentality or the choice of how is this happening for me? Yeah. How is this happening for me? Mm. So once you start to like, even most people don't even know they're, they are afraid. How many times have you asked somebody like, well, tell me more, like, what are you feeling? And they're like, oh, and they talk about how they're feeling. Like they don't give it a name. They just talk. <laughs> I struggled. I struggled with that when, when you and I worked together, because I couldn't find, we aren't given language for each feeling we feel, or they're in my experience growing up, culture, condition, parents, education, friendship groups, you name it. There wasn't a a space that held space. There was nowhere to go to say like, okay, I'm having this internal emotion, but what's the name of that? And I remember you giving me a list of all of these emotions. And it was the first time visually, gosh, I was 34, 33. When we worked together, it was the first time I had seen a list of a hundred emotions and thought, gosh, maybe it's actually not fear here. Maybe it's something around me feeling unworthy. Yeah. Maybe I'm feeling guilty, you know? And like, now we can start to piece together the experience in the body and the language I'm using out of my mouth, because that was really disconnected for me. Right. Right. And for those who might be listening, it is also okay not to name them. Some people like to be able to name their feelings and some people just want to describe it. Mm -hmm. That's helpful too. Because I would say I'm more of a feeling girl than a, Yeah, I process out loud, but I process out loud to probably get to a word through. This is what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the, the way through is to start to understand that your feelings from one end of the spectrum, the positive ones to the other end of the spectrum, what we would call the negative ones, which I don't consider negative, all of them are welcome. And if you can start to develop a relationship between you and your feelings and talk to them, I talk to my feelings. Like when fear's in the room, I'm like, hey, fear. <laughs> I was just going to say, what does that sound like? Let's do a little role play loud. here. I talk out loud all yeah. day, freaking long. They say the most intelligent people talk out loud. Well, I'm part of that group. I'm proud to be. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah, you are. Proud to be. So I will walk around my house and I will just notice, whoop, I got a feeling, um, which will usually, usually comes from a thought. Your thoughts create your feelings, Um, but I'll have a feeling and I'll be like, so now at the advanced level that I'm at, I will be like, okay, fear's in the room. Hey, fear. And I'll have fun with it. You know, I am an artistic person. I'm a funny person. And I'll be like, I feel you. I know you're here. What's up? What, what is it? What is it that you need? Mm. You know, and then I'll respond. And sometimes my fear voice is, you know, it's, it's whatever's there at that moment. So sometimes my fear voice is like, I don't know, I'm going to see if I can channel her right now. Um, She can be kind of like Southerny Texan, like y'all aren't listening. Like she gets like very fiery Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what is it? I can feel her. Yes. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, what, what is it that, what is it, what is it that I'm doing or not doing right now? that you might need me to do. And she'll give me an answer. And it's so wild because when you can become uh, in a, when you can develop a relationship with your feelings and they're not you, they'll, it's that separation where they just start to talk and you go, oh yeah, I have been avoiding that thing, (laughs) but it doesn't feel as scary anymore. Yeah. So for instance, 
I have a FedEx box that has been missing since September here in Mexico City. FedEx Mexico City does not operate like FedEx Global. <laughs> it's a whole other beast. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, they might they can lose your packages, and that's not there's nothing you can do about it. Okay. So I have a lost package right now, and that's kind of bugging me. And I know that if I call my credit card company, they'll probably reimburse me for the whole thing, plus the contents of this box. I have been sitting on this. I have a fear of rejection. I have a fear that the bank is going to say no, but I will get all these expectations that it's going to go great. And then I get a no, and then I have to recover from this like feeling of rejection. Whereas other people are like, hey, is this a possibility? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> Drop it. So I get kind of victim-y about this whole thing. And I get in, and I come from an inadequate place as well. Of course, I'm not like some like, you know, for some reason they don't want to give this to me because of who I am. I'll do that kind of, you know. And so I'll be running from this part of my life. I'll have this feeling of fear in my body or anxiety. I will slow the heck down. I will have a conversation with her and she will say, fear will say, or anxiety will say, I really want you to call RBC and get reimbursed for that FedEx box. Mm. Okay. It is unbelievably powerful when we can separate ourselves from our emotions and become friends with them, befriend them, make little characters out of them, give them voices. And the way that that works in our brain and the way that they tell the truth, because suddenly they're separate from who we are and it's not like impacting my like being mm -hmm. <laughs> and my ego is step aside. Mm -hmm. and so guess what I did? I hopped on the phone with RBC and got that cleaned up. Wait, so did you get the money back? <laughs> they're giving me the $200 for the shipping and uh, hey. what's happening is FedEx got in touch with me and said we think we found your box wow okay of course mm. yeah mm. yeah for There's you tools here. I'm gonna could tell you guys for 10 hours <laughs> I know the the tools are so and like listen for the tools listen to the nuances that Catherine are giving you because these are like real lived experiences and tools that you can actually start to integrate into day to day and that's where, you know, when you were, when you were sharing, one of my experiences is I can't hear myself until I get still. So I've always kind of used this energy of power in the pause. Like I'll have feelings or emotions, but I'll come back to these pause moments, which is not the way I was raised. I was raised to do more, get there faster, be the mask, more masculine kind of dominant type of energy in a room. And there's had to, for me, the experience of softening around finding the power in stillness has been an interesting journey over 10 years. I go back into old patterns quickly. And it's in those moments where I can like catch myself and find moments of stillness that I actually can hear myself. That may just be my piece of the journey or where I'm at in my journey. I'm curious yeah. for you. Cause I, I, heard you say like, when I feel the feeling, I kind of have to go inward to then start to have this conversation about understanding what that is. How has stillness played a role in your development of self and like how you have mastered some of these really advanced techniques? I'm curious. I want to ask you a question as well before I answer that question, because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about your audience and where they're at along their journey. How, when did you start to understand that there was power in the pause? Like, did something happen in your life? And then you're like, I got to slow way the heck down and pause. Mm -hmm. Or did you just decide one day, I think I need to pause. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I had a brick wall moment. One I have shared many times on this podcast already will continue to share. But for me, it was 2012 when I was diagnosed with a brain tumor after hitting what I thought was this pivotal moment in career, title, accolades, money, cars, houses, all the things, a relationship, all the things I thought I needed at that time and running specifically. Like I felt like I was a, if you put the visual, I was like a woman with her head down running full tilt in a direction that somebody pointed me one day. 
Yeah. They're like, Oh, I think you should go this way. And I was like, great. That's the way I'll put my head down and run as fast as I can. I did not see the brick wall coming. Although in hindsight, I probably had so many intuitive pings towards that, but it was the moment that I hit the brick wall fell flat on my face and it was in the rebuild that I learned. It wasn't in the first three or four months where the tendency was to go dark and very victim-y. Why is this happening to me? What was me? You know, there's a lot of negativity and spiraling going on. And then one day I walked into an RMT's office who just so happened to be a Reiki practitioner and say, like, you are not here for a massage. You are here to heal and to to do energy work, to do body work, to do the physical work, to release some of the trauma of my own past. And it was in that moment, that's the first real moment, Catherine, that I remember slowing down. I remember finding stillness. I'm thinking back to that moment. There was something within me that knew that within that stillness, I had to come back to the stillness again. I'm not exactly positive when like I started to hear myself, but there was something so profound about being still for an entire 90 minutes that my entire essence was like more of this. But that, yeah. that was the beginning of the journey, which was a decade ago. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So I think the audience wants to hear what am I looking for right now? That's going to lead me down the path to knowing that I need to pause. <laughs> and you mentioned there were probably some signs and some whispers, same for me. Mm-hmm. And some of us will have to hit rock bottom. I don't know if you consider what happened to you having been like a rock bottom moment. It's a, I mean, now it's the most beautiful thing that's ever happened in my life, right? <laughs> but in the moment, girlfriend, it felt like rock bottom. So yes, in, in context, it did. Great. Um, and that's also important for people to hear is if that's something that you are, you're, you know, feeling into in your body, I think there's something here. Know that on the other side of this is something incredible. It can be a gift. I've also experienced some stuff in my own body that you know about that I have since been able to heal naturally. You're all about that as well. So I think for the folks listening here, they're going to want to know what are the signs that I need to look for in my present day that this, I need this stuff, that this is where I'm going. I need to pause. Um, and it is the, the whispers of there's something here. First of all, if you're listening to this conversation at all and you're like, wow, this feels in my body, like a yes, and this is landing as truth, then follow that breadcrumb. Contact. That in itself is a whisper. That's the whisper. Mm-hmm. That's the whisper. Don't go try and sit and meditate every morning like I do for an hour, because I don't think it's going to, I don't suspect it'll work for all of you. It'll work for some of you, not all of you. Um, so yeah, listen to the whispers. If this is landing as truth in your body, then reach out for support get some you know, talk to somebody who gets this, who gets Mm -hmm. you're going to feel seen by. Right. And, and unfortunately, but fortunately, most of us will hit that rock bottom moment. And that's when we make the choice to change. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of a human thing. I was going to say, why do you think that is? Why do we I see it sometimes in these like high powering, high performing type of humans, women, men, um, in my context, I work with more women or I've seen more women do this where it does take the brick wall, or I've heard it as like a two by four across the head or like absolute rock bottom. Like these are the big wake up calls that forced me to X, get real with myself, get sober, you know? really go inwards and find stillness, whatever their next sentence is, there's like a moment in time. Have you, you just have worked with so many humans. So I'm curious to get your perspective around, is this just an innate human nature or like, why do we do that? Why do we wait for the big moments that the pain is almost so grand that we then change? Hmm. I think it's a case by case. 
you know, I could go the route of like, it's a pride thing, mm. but I just think it's a conditioning thing. Like we've been so, we've been raised to be so disconnected from our feelings that you suddenly need a big feeling to make a decision to shift. Uh, and I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Like when you get hit over the head with that two, four, I think it's a huge blessing. And some of us won't in this lifetime because we're not meant to. And some of us will, we're meant to wake up. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why, if I look, I, if I ask myself, why didn't I, you know, I, I didn't know. Yeah. I like physically hadn't, I, I mentally, spiritually, physically and emotionally had no idea. I had no idea until, you know, the universe intercepts. <laughs> mm -hmm. <It> says, hey. <laughs> and in my experience, the universe is always talking, right? Like the universe is always, I have a deep belief that the universe is always working with us and for us. And it is here for divine timing. And it really helps kind of paint. It has painted the picture for me deeply. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting. The amount of times I now will talk to universe. So you talked about like talking to your own emotions, but I will talk to universe about like, Hey, show me the path, show me the timing. Where do I need to be? Go back to Mary and Williams and some of her philosophies of like, where do I need to be? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to say in order to create the most, in order to live from a place of love and create in my mind, like really serve at the highest level for self and for all others. Like there's something in that for me where I, I don't, I see that my last name is service and that I know I'm here deeply to serve. And so I'm always coming back to that point of, you know, when I think purpose, when I think the bigger picture, it's like serve is always a piece of that. And as I expand and evolve and pivot and change, I know that the more I talk to that universe, the more the whispers are guiding me on whatever journey I meant to go on. But that took some letting go and trusting yeah. and still is taking letting go and trusting. Yeah. Curious question for you as we kind of pivot, how has letting go and trusting that this is all happening for you helped your evolution into this woman you are today? Uh, well, it's completely changed my life. I mean, letting go is one of the, like, it's so accessible to us as accessible as love is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like <laughs> your head is against the wall and again and again. Like, and you'll hear people say like, let go, man go and it's like let go of what though like what am I letting go of so um you know I think I'll as we wrap up here I'm, I'm thinking to answer your last question and tie it into this the other reason I think that people don't know is because a lot of people that you and I encounter are in their 30s 40s 50s the programming has been there for decades and we have to have a lot of compassion for ourselves it's it runs really deep from childhood and it's been there for a long time. And you've, you have been perpetuating it through language over the years, right? And telling the same freaking story about who you think you are, that you are not. They say your, your um, identity is just a bunch of conversations you've had over your whole life. It's just I a love that, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to start to look at how you talk about yourself. Okay. And identifying, finding, what do you say after I am? What is that statement that you keep making about yourself? I'm bad at math. I'm bad at relationships. I'm not a great mom. Da, 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 da. That is all an indication of where you have gotten away from love and yourself, your true self, your whole self. So that's a really good indicator for people. And for me, the letting go has been changing the dialogue. I have literally reworked the language that I use every day surrounding myself, surrounding relationship to others, surrounding others. That has been like a huge shift for me. I do not speak the way that I did even a year ago. Like it's constantly evolving because everything is just perpetuated through language. Mm. 
And boy, do we ever get to hold on <laughs> when we're <laughs> the same freaking story, mm-hmm. right? And then also, as I've done that, you know, I've, I've incorporated a morning practice that I'm very devoted to now. Devotion is a beautiful way to let go, in fact. It is one of the most powerful ways that you can let go when you surrender to silence and to something that is way bigger than you and to presence and peace and calm and ease. And that is not easy. And anyone listening to this, do not think that I want you to go to an altar right now and jump in and be like, peace and ease and calm. This takes time. Okay. And you've got to welcome yourself and meet yourself at every point in your own journey. All of it is relevant. This is not a race and there's nowhere for you to get to. You do not need to be healed. You are not broken and there's nothing wrong with you. Amen. Literally. Mm, I love that so much. Sister, we could talk for hours and there is no doubt I got that you, you. You, you will be back on. And I'm so curious to hear if you're listening in, if there's something that really landed let Catherine and I know, because maybe we'll do another episode on that particular topic, or we can dive in a little bit more for some Q and a, so I know we unpacked a lot here. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to get a hold of you and wants to know how to connect with you, be in your energy, be in your presence. I know you gift a lot just on social media with you showing up, but what are other ways people can find you and connect with you? Instagram is, is a beautiful place for me. I find, I find that it is such a powerful tool in my life. I haven't had any resistance to it yet. (laughs) So you are welcome to DM me. I respond to almost everybody, um, depending on what you're asking me. And then, I mean, right now that is the only way there are going to be more ways coming up in the near future, but yeah, that's the best way right now. You can also email me, but I am not great with my emails. And I'm the first person to admit that. <laughs> Beautiful. Tell it like it is. Go to Instagram. We will link, we will link that up in the show notes in case you want to know exactly how to spell Catherine and where to find her. So we'll make sure that you have access to that. But my love, this is a series of women who have inspired me along my path and my journey. And I know are going to inspire so many others just from having conversations like this. And so from the depth of my heart, I love you. Thank you for your time and your space and your energy. Thank you for the wisdom and sharing so openly with all of us. I feel like I just had a masterclass and I'm sure those tuning in feel the same way as always. It's, it's divinely timed and I'm just so dang grateful for your friendship. So thank Mm -hmm. you. I receive that. Yeah. And thank you to your audience. And I look forward to hearing how this opens up possibility for everyone, all of humanity. Mm, Beautiful. Until next time, guys, we'll see you again on the Jackie Service Show.